Welcome to Vigorous PEDs. I'm Coach Steve. In this video, we're going to discuss oral wind stroll versus injectable wind stroll. And let me preface this video by saying, if you came here looking for me to approve an oral wind stroll cycle without the use of testosterone, you came to the wrong place. It's not a good idea. By using wind stroll, your HPTA is going to downregulate, testosterone levels are going to decline, which results in declining estrogen levels. And now you lose out on the cognitive effects of estrogen, but especially the lipid effects of estrogen, keeping your HDL in range and your LDL somewhat close to the reference range. Wind stroll is very, very harsh on your lipid levels. And by keeping your estrogen levels in range, you mitigate some of the negative effects that oral wind stroll has on your lipid levels. Wind stroll is 17 alpha alkylated, so it doesn't get metabolized in the liver on the first pass, but during the first pass, it does increase cholesterol production. Then it increases cholesterol production in the muscle cells when it attaches to the androgen receptor, and then it gets glucoronated. And on the second pass, it produces even more cholesterol. So your lipid levels are going to be negatively impacted, and keeping your estrogen in range might mitigate some of these negative effects. But if you don't take any testosterone, and you don't allow testosterone to convert into estrogen, now you lose this protective effect, and your lipid levels are going to be so skewed that you're now on a one-way road to cardiovascular disease. So don't be that guy. Don't be stubborn. If you want to use Winstrol, you need testosterone as a base. Hormone replacement is enough. And in more cases than not, you don't need aromatized inhibitor because the estrogen is actually cardioprotective. So oral Winstrol versus injectable Winstrol. Oral Winstrol is very, very convenient. Like I mentioned before, it's going to pass the lever twice. Whereas with injectable winstrol, it's only going to pass the liver once. So now you have a higher bioavailability on a milligram for milligram basis. Keep in mind that whenever you take oral medication, you never get 100% bioavailability because some of that will get digested in the stomach acid, regardless of what compounds you're taking. Usually with steroid hormones, it's not the case. But when you take medications or supplements, some of that is going to get broken down in the stomach through stomach acid. Then it's going to the intestinal tract. Some of these nutrients or steroid molecules are going to bind to fiber, similar to how cholesterol binds to fiber, so do steroid molecules bind to fiber. And even though you take them on an empty stomach, some of them might still get passed along the intestinal tract completely without getting absorbed. So when you look at the bioavailability, injectable winstrol is 100% bioavailability and oral winstrol maybe 80 or 90%. So you have a little bit of a margin gap there when it comes to oral winstrol, it's not as bioavailable as injectable winstrol. Now the bioavailability of oral winstrol is further reduced during the first pass of the liver, because even though the majority doesn't get metabolized in the liver, a small portion, reducing the margin of bioavailability between oral winstrol and injectable winstrol, the margin is further reduced through glucocoronation. And when steroid hormones are glucocoronated, they're basically biologically inactive because the glucocoronation instructs the liver and the kidneys to metabolize them from the body. So again, you lose a little bit of bioavailability from oral winstrol as it passes into the intestinal tract and gets bound to fiber. And then you lose a little bit more bioavailability through the first pass of the liver where it already gets glucoronated, which renders it biologically inactive. Then when this reduced dose of winstrol finally enters the bloodstream, travels to the skeletal muscle where it attaches to the androgen receptors, and potentiates its effect on gene transcription, it still gets glucoronated, promoting excretion through the kidneys or the liver. So when it comes to bioavailability, oral winstrol is perhaps only 60% bioavailable on a milligram for milligram dose, compared to injectable winstrol, which is almost 100% bioavailable because it's not subject to stomach acid or fiber in the intestinal tract, but it's also not subject to glucocoronation in the liver on the first pass because it's already in the body and exits the depot. Now you can clearly see this in the half-life because oral winstrol has a half-life of maybe nine hours, whereas injectable winstrol has a half-life of 24 hours, which also extends its detection time because winstrol remains in the depot and then has to travel from the injection site after the water has already exited leading to a significant amount of post-injection pain. We'll get to that later. So the injectable winstrol needs to leave the depot, which takes several days because it has a 24-hour half-life, whereas with oral winstrol, you need to dose that throughout the day just to maintain serum concentrations. 
So with injectable wind stroll, the half-life is extended because a large amount of the steroid molecules remains in the depot after the water has dissipated. Again, water is very easy to absorb compared to oil-based injections because they are subject to lipases and esterases, breaking it all apart. Well, wind stroll doesn't have an ester and water doesn't have to be broken down by lipases because your whole body is basically water and it can just dissipate. And because all the water of the injection site dissipates over a few hours, the windstroll steroid molecules remain behind, which then start to irritate the cell membrane, causing a significant amount of post-injection pain. Now, there are several ways around that. You can dilute the windstroll injection from, let's say, 100 milligrams per milliliter down to 20 milligrams per milliliter. I usually advise my clients to mix their injectable windstroll with either injectable carnitine or injectable glutathione or bacteriostatic water. Now, don't get me wrong here. Injectable glutathione and injectable carnitine can still cause a decent amount of post-injection pain, similar to how B12 or B-complex injection causes post-injection pain. But this post-injection pain only lasts for a couple hours or maybe goes away in an hour or so. Whereas the post-injection pain of injectable windstroll can last for days, for days. So you use a moderately post-injection pain causing water-based injection, mix that with the windstroll to dilute it, resulting in less prolonged injection pain, even though at the time of injection, it's still going to hurt. There's no real way around it unless you end up with an underground lab that somehow mixes lidocaine in their windstroll or injectable glutathione formulation and then you might feel a little bit numb. Personally, I've never used products which contain lidocaine unless I went to the dentist and I had to do some dental work. You know, they numb the area using a lidocaine injection, which is usually the lidocaine injection is more painful than the actual dental work, but that's probably because the area is now numb. So I know some of the underground labs, they actually mix a little bit of lidocaine inside their windstroll or glutathione injections, making it a little bit easier for the end consumer. If you have access to that, great. The post-injection pain of injectable windstroll, especially when you dilute it with an injectable carnitine, injectable glutathione or B12 or B-complex formula or back to static water will be severely reduced because now you allow for more time for this steroid molecule to dissipate and get absorbed into the bloodstream. So I always tell my clients when they use injectable windstroll during a contest prep to dilute 100 milligrams over 5 milliliters of water. So let's say the concentration of the injectable windstroll is 100 milligrams per one milliliter. They add another four milliliters of injectable carnitine on top, which reduces the post-injection pain significantly. Again, the post-injection pain is still going to be there, but it's not going to be that severe. And it's certainly not going to be crippling, preventing you to train certain body parts. Now, I prefer to only do these water-based injections with high volume of five milliliters in my glutes, my quads, or my lats. Because I'm training these body parts basically every other day, or one of these body parts every other day. And even though I'm injecting windstroll every other day with this method, due to its 24-hour half-life, serum concentration will remain reasonably elevated. And now I have less overall post-injection pain compared to everyday injections in an attempt to keep my serum concentrations as stable as possible. Regardless of administration route, windstroll will definitely skewer lipid levels, so you always have to make sure there's something in place to prevent that from happening, whether that's a red yeast red supplementation or a citrus bergamot or a real statin, making sure you get enough fiber in your diet to detoxify some of the excess cholesterol into the intestinal tract and out through your stool. You'll have to put everything in place to maintain your lipid levels the best you can whenever you're using Windstroll, whether that's oral or injectable, because both versions will skew your lipids quite significantly. When it comes to collagen, both oral Windstroll and injectable Windstroll will alter collagen synthesis. And it's very beneficial in the skin, especially when you're doing a contest prep or cutting phase, because the dermis slowly reduces in size, because the collagen in the dermis actually gets catabolized while you're dieting. Now, you can optimize this process by going to an all-fish diet, which excludes some collagen types, like collagen 1 is only found in fish, but it doesn't contain collagen 2, 3, or 4, or some of the other collagen types. So, fish only has collagen type 1. Now, if you ever follow the diet with a lot of beef, like a carnivore diet, for example, a lot of people notice that their skin is a little bit thicker, and it's because beef has collagen type 1 and 3. And it's a type 3 that contributes a little bit to skin thickness in the dermis and the epidermis, whereas when you exclude that, your skin slowly gets thinner. 
So you switch to a diet which is predominantly fish. Now you only get collagen type 1 and you exclude collagen type 2 which is found in chicken, collagen type 3 which is found in beef or uh, beef supplements in the form of collagen protein which is collagen type 1 and 3 because it's made from hydrolyzed bovine hide. So it's the skin being processed into a protein powder. And collagen type 4 is mostly found in eggs. So when you exclude eggs, beef, and chicken from your diet, now you only get collagen type 1 from fish, which greatly enhances the skin thinning effect of Winstrol because you exclude certain building blocks and you slowly catabolize the collagen that's in the dermis because Winstrol changes the collagen synthesis within the dermis and other parts of the body. So in terms of the skin and its skin thinning effects, it's definitely beneficial. But the same thing happens in the joints, tendons, and ligaments. So in the skin, you can't really feel, right? You just see that you look more shredded in the mirror. But when you start lifting on Winstrol, whether that's oral or injectable Winstrol, and by excluding certain collagen types that actually contribute to joint integrity and tendon strength, now you're actively compromising your tendons, risking injury just to get your skin thinness down. So you need a decent amount of experience within your own body because when you switch to Winstrol and an all-fish diet, if you keep training the way you've always been doing, you might get injured. So this is one of the reasons why a lot of pros towards the end before the competition, they slowly reduce the training intensity. Again, if they're using Winstrol, if they're not using Winstrol, then they usually train balls to the wall towards the end because it's the Winstrol that reduces the joint integrity. And in a combination with an all fish diet, you're a little bit brittle and fragile, especially when you overuse the aromatized inhibitors towards the end and your serum estrogen levels goes down, which result in even less water retention, even less collagen synthesis. And now you're completely brittle. Now your skin is thin. You look freaking shredded. You look hard, dry and dense, but you're actually in a very brittle and very fragile state. And that's why towards the later stages of prep, you don't really train that hard because you're just going to get injured. So regardless of which administration technique of Winstrol you use, the longer you take it, the more careful you have to be while working out, because otherwise it's going to result in injury. And the longer you take it, the more negative effects you'll see in regards to your connective tissue. Now, when it comes to thinning of the skin, especially when you combine it with an all fish diet, I feel that the maximum effect is reached within six weeks. Now, you still have to think about discontinuing certain hormones during contest prep, like a, a growth hormone, and let's say three weeks out because it promotes water retention and, and disregarding the effects of serum estrogen levels that could have a water retention. I feel that the maximum effect of thinning of the skin is seen after about six weeks, maybe eight weeks. And it also highly depends on how much beef you're eating during the off season or the early stages of contest prep which will determine how long you need to be on Winstrol and an all-fish diet in order to get the thinnest skin possible for a freaky look on stage. So let's bring it all back. I feel that injectable Winstrol is a lot more effective compared to oral Winstrol. I also feel that it doesn't impact your blood work markers as much as oral Winstrol does because oral Winstrol passes the liver twice, which increases liver enzymes, but also skews the lipid levels way more compared to injectable Winstrol. So when it comes to health, health and effectiveness injectable winstrol is far superior over oral winstrol but oral winstrol is a little bit more convenient and i do feel that oral winstrol has place in the off season to complement a cycle with anadrol because 50 milligrams of anadrol holds a significant amount of water retention and again increases the pump but it doesn't increase the mind muscle connection so much but because winstrol lowers water retention a little bit and increases mind muscle connection a five to one ratio of anadrol to winstrol could be beneficial in the off season and i don't see so much negative effects in regards to collagen synthesis when i only use 10 milligrams of winstrol per day because the 50 milligrams or 100 milligrams of anadrol that i'm using is increasing the collagen synthesis more than enough to compensate so in that sense the only reason why i would want to use Oral Winstrol is in combination with Anadrol at a 5 to 1 ratio. And that pretty much concludes it. So I'm sorry I had to wait this long for this comparison video. I left it out on purpose in the video about all the other 17 alpha alkylated oral steroids. So I could do this comparison video by itself. I prefer injectable Winstrol. Let me know which version of Winstrol you prefer to use right down in the comment fields. Thank you guys so much for watching. And I'll see you in the next video.
And don't forget to leave me a like. That's always highly appreciated.